that's drunk. Sometimes with these videos, at first glance, it might seem like I'm making some of these games up, like The Adventures of Rad Gravity, for example. Or no, I'm sorry, The Adventures of Rad Gravity, gotta make sure you say it right while talking like a totally gnarly 90s dude, man. This was released in December 1990 for the NES by Interplay, well before their more recognizable Super Nintendo games like Out of This World and Clay Fighter. Their NES output is a bit more suspect, however, putting out games like Swords and Serpents, a decent dungeon crawler for the time, and the video game adaptation of Total Recall, which is mediocre at best if you want to be kind. Adventures of Rad Gravity might be their best effort on the NES, and that may not be saying a whole lot, but this is a surprisingly ambitious game. I gotta start by talking about the manual, which features a 14-panel comic that tells the story. I love stuff like this. The basic gist is that an evil wizard used interstellar magic to mutate himself into a giant brain to terrorize the galaxy, and you as Rad Gravity have to fly from planet to planet in an attempt to stop him, and to do that, you get a health meter and one life to get through 10 levels with a password system. You start up the game sitting in your captain's chair, zooming across space with your giant eyeball computer companion, and... Blah! Okay, so Rad Gravity has some Captain Novelin vibes, and that's never a good thing. I mean, look at this guy's face. He looks like a poorly designed mascot for a minor league hockey team, like he's related to the Purdue Boilermaker. And yes, since it's an American-made character, of course he needs an egregious butt chin. I mean, jeez, this guy really needs some chinderwear. At first glance, this looks like your regular action platformer, but instead of just running through levels back to back, you have to fly around in your ship and find them. And to do that, you need to find access codes. So you go down to this first level, and you got Doc Brown jamming out to Huey Lewis on his Walkman. You got John Reese Davies' heads floating around. Honestly, this is one of those games where you don't even need to bother with enemies unless they're in your way. All you have to do is keep going until you reach a door or a teleporter. And besides, this is one of those games where enemies constantly respawn, so killing them feels useless half the time. For what it's worth, the controls are decent enough, if not a little loose. I've played worse, but I've also played better. And you can shoot in four different directions, which also helps. What I really like is that enemies can destroy other enemies. I love when games do that. Anyway, you go down here, log on to CompuServe, I guess, and you get an access code for a new planet you can visit. Each planet has its own gimmick or story segment or fetch quest, like this part here where after you get the next planet code, a couple dudes hijack your computer eyeball friend and toss it into an ice cream truck and drive away. And you gotta run across these conveyor belts over lava to catch up. This game may look pretty jank and play kinda jank, but these segments really add a lot to help the game stand out. There's also levels where you have to figure out how to use these keys to unlock these walls, before what I presume is a giant dinosaur foot that tries to stomp you. You gotta love those graphics. There's a zero-g level where you float around through an asteroid field using your weapon to propel yourself. Then this level here where you move blocks around and try and figure out how to get by. And there's a level that's just upside down. You talk to this guy who thinks he's stuck with the most smug dog in history, only he doesn't know that title belongs to a certain Clyde dog. Then you fetch a computer module thing to help flip gravity around. I would have liked to have seen more gravity-centric gimmicks, but whatever, what's here is fine. You can always tell when you're playing a third-party NES game, the controls always feel at least a tiny bit sloppy, and Rad Gravity is no different. The graphics are also blocky and primitive, as you can see, and sometimes they actually work against the game. Like this part here, where there's platforms that are supposed to be branches in this tree? It just looks really cheap. The worst level in the game is the spaceship level, where you wander around forever looking for a part to fix your ship. You've got these tubes that lead to other tubes, which lead to teleporters, which lead to other teleporters, and you find keys that you use to unlock more tubes, and just... ugh. I also gotta mention the music. The title theme is one of the most unhinged, insane pieces of music I think I've ever heard. It sounds like someone trying to figure out how to play the Simpsons theme and failing badly. <laughs> There are only three pieces of music in this game, and this is one of them. Otherwise, you're stuck with hearing this theme about 90% of the time. So yeah, Adventures of Rad Gravity is one of those games that's obscure, and it's probably obscure for a reason. It didn't sell well at the time, and the graphics, sound, and controls are cheap and janky. But hey, this is Interplay. There's some solid ideas here, and it's not like they didn't try. I mean, you may laugh at this dinosaur foot, but with some better graphics, that looked pretty cool. The structure in Rad Gravity is good, but the graphics, sound, and gameplay need a lot more polish. As it is, this game is a bit of a janky mess, but it definitely has its charm. 
Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.